October 21st, 2015. That is the future date that Marty McFly would travel to in the timeless sequel, Back to the Future Part 2, released in 1989. His objective? To save his son from making poor choices that would ultimately lead to his family's shame and demise. And while he's there, he gets to see what will be a pretty rad future, complete with flying cars, self-drying jackets, and hoverboards. October 21st is now affectionately celebrated as Back to the Future Day. And to celebrate, the curious minds at the Houston Museum of Natural Science ask the question, hey, it's 2021, where's our hoverboards? In case you're not familiar, hoverboards were 2015's alternative to the skateboard. But instead of traveling on wheels, the device hovered. We see it hovering over gravel, pavement, stone, a wooden bridge, a car's windshield, and while it does hover over water, it does not hold its momentum. Hey McFly, you bojo! <gasps> the bus don't work on water! Unless you've got power! <laughs> <laughs> they were made by Mattel, and so readily available that two little girls are just cruising down the sidewalk on them. But today, while you can pick up replicas, there is no mass market equivalent to what we saw in the film. The future is now 2021, so where's our hoverboards? To field this most important of questions, we turn to Carolyn Leap. So we're thinking about why we don't have hoverboards for everybody uh, easily used at home. And so as part of that, we're thinking about, well, if we do build a hoverboard, how do we power it? How is it hovering? What are the challenges, right? So when we look at the ones in the movie, uh, it seems like we're talking about something that maybe is doing some magnetic levitation. And the basic idea there seems pretty simple, right? Here I've got some fairly strong magnets that are what we'd say maybe levitating or hovering over each other pretty well. If I push them down, they repel up. They push up pretty strongly, right? And we're used to experimenting with magnets a little bit like this, or even some regular sort of ceramic magnets. These are neodymium, which is a really strong type of magnet. So here I have some magnets stuck together, and if you want to get them to levitate, you just sort of reverse them. So if we have north and south poles and magnets, the like poles, uh, repel. So we have North Pole facing North Pole or South Pole facing South Pole. They're going to repel or levitate like this. And that's fine, but you'll notice I'm doing this on a pencil and we have these ones on a stick. And that's because this is not a very stable setup. So this is not a very stable setup right now. You can see they're starting to tilt towards one side. And if you take them off of here, what you're going to see is all of a sudden that they just sort of flip over. So they repel, they flip over, they stick to each other. It doesn't work very well. They don't stay nicely uh, spaced apart like you would need it to do for a hoverboard to actually go along and keep you off the ground. So we need a way to control that, which you could do with super, condu super conductivity uh, where you need liquid nitrogen, you're getting something very, very cold, and you can have something sort of sitting nicely instead of springing off to try to stick to another magnet like that but that's a little bit tricky and complicated and not an easy thing to just keep in the garage at home. So that's not a really great option. Uh, another thing that we can see here is, uh, this is how at least one prototype hoverboard has worked. I have this copper tube here and another really strong magnet. And I have this non-magnetic cylinder that looks kind of the same shape and size. And if I drop this through, it's gonna do about what you expect, which is it's gonna fall to the ground, okay? So that falls through, falls to the ground. If I try that with my neodymium magnet, it does fall through, but it falls much more slowly. And the reason for that is as this magnet is falling through this conducting material, right? This copper tube, copper's a really good electrical conductor. That means electricity can flow through it really easily. As this magnet falls through it, it induces something called eddy currents. 
and those end up creating an opposing magnetic field. So just like our magnets repelling before, right? That's all it is. And that slows down the fall. So at least one prototype hoverboard that a company has made uses this same principle where they have an array of magnets, just a bunch of magnets that are sort of rotating around and they repel over a surface as long as that surface is something like copper. So they had to build an entire copper floor to make that work. So that's not super practical if you want to have your hoverboard just out going down the sidewalk unless you plan to get all the sidewalks in your neighborhood turned into copper. So it's an interesting idea. It's a little challenging. The liquid nitrogen and superconducting prototype hoverboard had to also have a specially built track for it to work. And if we're thinking about something that looks like a skateboard in the movie, it's actually pretty tricky to balance that. It's hard enough if you're driving a regular skateboard and you have wheels under it, right? Because they're on both sides and that gives you some kind of stability. But if you're actually just pivoting back and forth like this and there's nothing to catch you on those sides, your balance has to be extraordinarily good. So it takes a lot of practice even for like a professional skateboarder to test out one of these hoverboards. All right, so it's interesting to think about, well, what does happen over the water in the movie, because it's a little hard to figure out what the physics is behind what we see, right? So he ends up over the water, he stops moving forward, but we can't really think of why that would happen, right? Your momentum is just your mass times your velocity. Nothing about that should have changed. Uh, the surface of the water doesn't really seem like it should cause a problem with his forward motion, right? And he keeps hovering. So that part's a little bit uh, different than the laws of physics would suggest. And similarly, another place we see that is where he's pushing off of the air with his foot. And there's just nothing to push off of there. The air moves too easily. You need something to push against, right? It actually helps us to have friction when you're trying to walk. You're pushing off the ground. You need the bottom of your shoe or your foot to really be sort of rubbing against that ground, pushing against it and some friction so that you can push off. Okay, so one way that hovering over a surface can be possible is using sort of a cushion of air. So I think like an air hockey table where there's a very thin layer of air that's sort of pushing up and something can sit on that layer and be pushed back up as well. So this little hover puck here is gonna push air out these holes in the bottom and that's gonna let it ride much closer to the ground than you see with my hand here. Uh, we're not even gonna see the gap. But what that's doing is it's reducing the friction between this disc and the ground. And that's the key idea of hovering is that you're sort of skimming over a surface instead of staying in contact with it. And that you should be able to go pretty fast uh, without friction slowing you down then. So we'll turn this on, get our little cushion of air and see what this little guy does here. Well, that's it for our video. Thank you so much for being curious with us. Happy Back to the Future Day, and we hope that a trip to the Houston Museum of Natural Science is in your future.